Now that winter's here, I crave warm cozies, and I bet you do too. What's good for warm cozy woolens? Look no further than the rugged Icelandic sheep. Junkies, welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. Today we are going to be returning to our wool series, which we have taken a little bit of a break from. So if you are a new viewer, every so often on the podcast we will do uh, another episode in our wool series. The wool series is where we take a different breed of sheep and we look at the individual and unique characteristics of that breed, what kind of uh, items you might want to knit or crochet or craft from it, how to spin it if um, if I have any notes on spinning. Some of them I don't have a lot of experience or um, notes with on spinning, but I'll give you the ones where I do. And then we talk a little bit about the history of the breed, what makes it unique and special. The reason that we do this is because much like fine wines or really good gourmet food, the more you know about the origins, the uses, and the unique individual flavors of your wool, a lot like wine and food. It will help you to appreciate it more and then you can pair the perfect wool with the perfect project. It'll help you understand why it's best not to use a really, really fine, delicate type of wool with um, something, an item that is going to get a lot of abrasion like socks or why you wouldn't want to use a really super rugged, primitive breed of wool for that really extra cushy cowl around your neck because all that rugged wool is just gonna scratch your neck and you're gonna think that wool is terrible when it's not. It's just not being used for its proper purpose. It's kind of like trying to take your vacuum cleaner outside in the snow and vacuum up the snow in your yard. You're gonna think a vacuum is a pretty terrible invention if you try to do that because that's not what it's intended for, right? So today we're going to talk about a totally different type of breed than we have ever discussed in the wool series before. We kind of started with fine wools and started working our way through like Merino and um, Polworth and uh, Rambouillet, some of the more common fine wools that are made for just really, really super soft next to the skin, fine garments, extra special things. They're, they tend to be a lot more popular right now in yarn stores and with indie dyers, so they're a lot easier to find. We have also talked about a couple of other breeds like uh, BFL that are becoming more easy to find and some of the unique cool characteristics of those. But today I wanted to talk about something completely different, which is a dual coated primitive breed called Icelandic sheep. As you can probably guess from the name Icelandic, just means the, where they originate from. Um, so the Icelandic sheep breed that we have today was brought into Iceland by the Viking settlers over 1100 years ago. So it's been there for a long time. Uh, several attempts were made over the years to crossbreed the Icelandic sheep with other types of breeds just to kind of try and improve the versatility of the wool because while their wool had great wonderful characteristics, it had very specific limitations like most breeds. And most breeds throughout history have been crossbred with multiple other sheep breeds over time. Sometimes the results are not great so we let it go, sometimes we keep honing and refining, sometimes it works out wonderfully, etc. And a lot of our favorite breeds these days are actually the result of a crossbred version of a couple of different older sheep way, way back down the history line. And now we have their descendants and um, we've decided on a, a crossbreed that was just right. And so that particular crossbred version becomes a new breed of sheep. But with the Icelandic sheep, they were finding that it was really difficult to crossbreed and the few attempts that were made were so disastrous that they decided just to scrap the whole thing. And um, at that point, which I actually don't remember the exact year, but at that point, they actually made it illegal to import any sheep into Iceland. So um, the results of their crossbreeding was so bad, they decided it was really important to protect the breed in its pure state. And because Icelandic sheep has such unique characteristics from any other sheep breeds in the world, and they've developed even more of like a sturdy, hardy ruggedness based on their environment that they were being raised in in Iceland, the Icelandic government wanted to make sure that nothing would come in and contaminate 
their sheep. And it has actually now become a very recognizable type of wool and a very recognizable sheep in the world. And so it's really got its own very unique characteristics that really are are pretty unique to the point where nobody else has really had a sheep that mimics that very closely. So it is really important to keep it pure. Because of that, it means that the Icelandic sheep is definitely one of the world's oldest and purest sheep breeds, meaning it hasn't had any contaminating crossbred, um, any, any contamination crossbred into it. So that's pretty cool. If you think about it, um, like 1100 years ago doesn't sound like that much off the top of your head, or maybe it does to you, but when I was doing research, I was like, oh, I kind of expected it to be older. 1100 years in the grand scheme of things doesn't sound that old. But really when you think about it, that's a really long time. That's well over a thousand years ago. Um, and it's kind of crazy to think, when you think of all the things that were around 1100 years ago and what they look like or sound like or are like today, to think that the sheep is pretty close, if not exactly the same as it was 1100 years ago. It has the exact same uh, characteristics and makeup as its ancestors 1100 years ago. That's crazy. That's why it's called a primitive breed because it has had very little um, interference from man over that time. It hasn't been crossbred or anything. And it maintains its um, same characteristics from a really long time ago, so it still has those primitive characteristics. It hasn't been uh, modernized and updated and certain characteristics bred out and other ones brought in, etc. So what makes these sheep so special? Well, one thing is farmers who work with these sheep talk about how smart they are, that they're very feisty and independent. And I'm not gonna lie, when I read that, I was like, aw, my heart goes out to you. <laughs> feisty, independent sheep. I love those terms. Um, I probably wouldn't love it so much if I was the farmer that had to deal with the feistiness, but it sounded really cute and endearing, um, especially because you don't think of sheep as being feisty, but they can be. So um, part of what makes these sheep unique is unlike other sheep breeds, they don't have very many of the same flocking tendencies or instincts that a lot of other sheep breeds do. They tend to be, um, they still like work within family units and flocks and things, but they don't tend to be as much into just all clumping together and moving as a flock everywhere they go. They're a little bit more independent. They're a little bit more willing to kind of wander off on their own. Um, they're used to the really, really cold and rugged terrain and climate of Iceland. And so they're super, super sturdy and hardy um, and really, really healthy sheep, which is really nice for their farmers, I'm sure. The wool of Icelandic sheep is very unique. So. It is called a dual coated breed because obviously, as you can infer from the name, there are two different coats to an Icelandic sheep. It has an undercoat that grows close to its uh, body and it's the warmer, softer, finer fleece that keeps the animal really cozy and warm. And then there's an outer coat that grows on top of that, like a second layer of fur. It's a totally different feel and texture than the bottom undercoat. And it can even be a different color, which makes it really interesting to work with. Um, and the outer coat tends to be sturdier, more rugged. It's the one that's really gonna waterproof and protect the sheep from the elements. And um, it's kind of just like when you put on your soft, cozy, snuggly sweater that you wear in the house, and then you put on your rugged winter coat to go out in the snow and shovel the driveway, right? You need that extra layer that's a little more rugged and sturdy, but you wouldn't wear your coat as part of your outfit around the house when you're inside the heat. Um, you wouldn't need it, but also it's gonna be a lot more awkward and and it's just bulkier and more rugged and built for protecting you from the winds outside. Well, since the sheep don't get to come in inside, they don't get to take theirs off. <laughs> um, and so they have the outer and the um, inner coat, the, the under layer as well. So what makes those kind of unique is like I mentioned, they're different colors a lot of times. Not always, but they frequently are different colors. Usually Icelandic sheep, when they are shorn, the outer and under coat are actually blended together in most preparations. Now they can be separated out, and when that is the case, the outer coat, which um, is actually called the tog, the outer coat or tog is going to be pretty rough and not really what you want to hand knit with by itself. So generally it's better for things like ropes and carpets and um, more like utilitarian purposes. The inner coat, which is called the fell, T-H-E-L, the fell is very, very soft. It's a lot finer than the outer coat. And so if you separate them out and you just 
uh, work with the fell, while it is going to be a lot, it's going to be a lot closer to a fine wool. So you're going to need to be careful not to use it by itself with something that is going to have a lot of abrasion, like socks or gloves. You're going to want to keep it for really, really special, super soft items, a dressy sweater, a nice little cowl, something that's not going to see a lot of wear and tear. Uh, but it is going to be very, very soft, very warm because it's designed to keep all of that sheep's body heat trapped within and very, very snugly warm. Um, it's going to be extra warm, extra soft, extra fine. But usually the two are blended together, which gives you a really nice wool that's kind of a good workhorse kind of a wool. This isn't going to be the thing that you're just going to want to snuggle up with in bed at night. It's not gonna be what you wanna wrap your baby in. Um, if you have really sensitive skin, you're not gonna to wanna to wear it next to your skin. It's gonna be better for like mid-range garments. So um, it's really great for outerwear, like a jacket or a sweater that you put over another shirt and you wear as kind of like, almost like a, a jacket or a coat or something. It's also gonna be great for things like mittens, for slippers that you're gonna be walking around in, but you wanna keep your feet kind of protected and warm. Um, kind of wear that mid-range, not really great next to the skin, but it's not like so coarse that you wouldn't wear it at all. You, you'll still really enjoy working with it, especially if the two have been blended together. It'll be really nice to work with, but you won't necessarily want to make a snuggly baby blanket out of it. You know, it'll it'll be best for like jackets and mittens and, and coats and those kinds of things. Um, possibly a scarf depending on, on how you wear it, but um, kind of more that mid-range to kind of more rugged outerwear. So the cool thing by having two different coats, the fell and the tog do have different characteristics. So uh, when we talk about like micron count and staple length, we have to look at both of them individually. So the fell, which again is the undercoat, that soft snuggly sweater that the sheep wears just to stay warm, is going to be 19 to 22 microns. And if you remember, that is definitely within that fine wool category, very similar to merino. Uh, merino can sometimes get to be just a little bit finer than that down to like 16 or even 15 microns for ultra fine merino but um, in general it's going to be in that like 16 to 22 range and this is 19 to 22 so definitely within that range hi phoebe everybody's favorite co-host is back i've gotten so many comments on phoebe lately and how she is one of every, one of the favorite uh, parts of the show she loves to be on camera too so she's always finding ways to get out here so the tog or the outer coat by contrast is going to be 27 to 32 microns. This is a significantly rougher type of micron count. So this is definitely not going to be um, a really soft snuggly next to the skin. But if you blend the two together, you get somewhere in the middle range because they kind of balance each other out really nicely. As far as staple length goes for spinning, the fell is only two to three inches in staple length, which is pretty short. Definitely more in that fine wool category again and on the short side of even the fine wools. The tog or outer coat is going to be much longer and much easier to get uh, those wavy locks at six to eight inches. And the difference in them is the, um, the fell is going to be really, really short, fine, and really irregular fibers. So it doesn't have a really regular crimp to it. Um, if you remember what crimp is, it's how much, uh, how tightly uh, wavy the, the yarn is or the, the wool is. So if you take a lock of wool from the sheep, if it's got um, a slower, more gentle wave, that's going to be more of like the long wools. If it's got a really fun, a tight crimp to it, where it looks kind of like crimped hair from the 80s, that's gonna be more like the fine wool categories. Um, it makes it a lot more bouncy and um, tends to just be in that shorter, fine staple length. Also that tight crimp shortens that staple length up, whereas when it's longer and wavy, it stretches it out, okay? So that's how you can kind of remember it. Longer wavy stretches it out, short and fine, tightens it up. So the fell or the undercoat is gonna be um, more of a tighter crimp, but it's not regular. It's very irregularly crimped. And so it's just, it can be really, really tricky to work with spinning on its own. Um, when you are looking at the tog or the outer coat, it has that longer wavy lock type of feel to it. Um, so it's going to be a lot more similar to like a mohair or something along those lines. Um, if it's at least on the finer end of the spectrum, some of the more rugged um, fleeces are going to be a lot scratchier than that, but it's going to be similar to that type of, of wave and um, feel and, and how you would work with it. 
That's why usually the two are blended together because it makes the best of both the characteristics to kind of meet in the middle and you're able to use more of that tog outer coat. And the cool thing that I found out when I was researching this is uh, they were talking about how most Icelandic yarn, um, which is called Lopi, most Lopi yarn is a uh, going to blend both of those two together and the tog or the outer coat is going to almost like create this more open breathable kind of lofty feel so um, that the finer tightly crimped uh, fell fibers underneath the really soft ones can bloom in the wash and can really open up and expand and become even softer so it's really cool when you blend the two together because they kind of play off of each other's characteristics and it softens the undercoat and kind of opens up the outer coat and they just blend really beautifully into this super lofty airy bouncy kind of sturdy wool. It's weird because it's so lofty, but it's also really sturdy, which a lot of times those don't necessarily go together. So Lopi yarn, let's talk about Lopi a little bit. Lopi is the traditional Icelandic yarn, and it is basically a very bulky single ply that is made with the combined tell and thog. Oh, tell and thog, I messed those up, it's backwards. Fell and tog, how about that? <laughs> The fell and the tog, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. I'm sure I should say it with an Icelandic accent, say like tog or something. I don't know what their accents sound like, but <laughs> I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. But fell and tog is what it looks like, and I don't have an accent, so we're just going to go with my Kansas City accent instead. <laughs> um, but the, um, what was I saying? Oh yes, lopey yarn. <laughs> Uh, so when they're spinning the lopi, they put the fell and the tog together, and then um, it's very, very loosely twisted. So there's barely any twist to it. So usually if you're not a spinner, just to help you understand this a little bit, when you're spinning yarn, um, you do what's called drafting, where you pull out the wool a little bit, um, and then you put twist into the yarn by either spinning your drop spindle or using your wheel, and it's going to twist that yarn, and you can get a really, really tight twist for a really sturdy yarn, or you can do a softer twist if you just want a little bit, but you want to leave more of the natural characteristics of the yarn in. Um, and generally, the less twist you get, um, the more you have to be really careful with uh, watching for like pilling and abrasion and things, which is why single ply yarns that don't have as much twist and are not plied with anything else to hold them in tend to be not as great for things like you wouldn't want to use a single ply sock yarn for, for socks. They're, they're not called a sock yarn, they're called a fingering weight because they're, while they're fine for shawls and sometimes even sweaters, you don't want to use them on something high abrasion like socks. So same kind of a thing with the Lopi yarn. It is a single ply and it's very, very loosely twisted. In fact, it reminds me a lot more of like a thin roving almost than um, a really twisted spun yarn. Um, and there are various different myths and legends about how this, this was started, um, but I heard one time take it with a grain of salt, it might be just be an old folk tale. But I heard that there was an Icelandic woman who was trying to um, produce yarn more quickly to help support her family. And so rather than taking the yarn from her sheep and doing the normal um, carding and preparation and everything and, and twisting it up and then spinning it tightly and plying it and everything else, she just grabbed some washed wool and uh, started like knitting with it. <laughs> and um, like was barely twisting it in her hands as she went. And that was kind of the origination of the loosely twisted, bulky single ply just that feels almost like fresh wool when you're working with it. I don't know if that's true or not. I heard it, um, I don't know, take it with a grain of salt, but um, it's kind of a fun little story to like think about it. It kind of fires the imagination a bit. So uh, Lopi yarn or, um, Icelandic yarn, which makes the Lopi yarn, has kind of a medium to high luster depending on the breed and how it is prepared and whether or not they separate the outer and undercoats. But generally it's kind of more of that mid-range luster. It's not super, super lustrous like silk or anything. Um, it's gonna be a bit more rugged and a bit more classic. Now the Lopi sweaters that they make in Iceland today that uh, you can still buy there, there is a bit of misunderstanding. So these are traditional Icelandic sweaters and they tend to have um, some 
color work worked into them, oftentimes in the yoke. Usually they're like a kind of a big bulky pullover with like dropped shoulders. And they usually are done with undyed wool, so they're natural colors. So you'll have like some whites and various shades of browns and grays to kind of create the color work there. Um, they, they, so they kind of have that more like rugged farm look and feel, kind of more subtle color work. And uh, a lot of times they have a slightly hairy kind of a feel, which is that outer uh, tog coat that mimics mohair a lot of times. It can have kind of that slightly more hairy appearance to it. It's not a, a super, um, super bouncy, commercially spun and plied yarn like we're often used to seeing on our more modern sweaters. It's a little bit more hairy and rugged and, and primitive and the stitch definition isn't super high but it creates really really beautiful cozy sweaters. Um, now there is a misunderstanding that these sweaters are as old as the sheep themselves and people have been knitting these for hundreds of years. That's actually not true. Uh, like a lot of traditional knitwear that we think of today, like Fair Isle sweaters and things like that, um, the Icelandic sweater was not actually that old. In fact, I believe it was the 1930s when it became popular and started being um, created for like tourists and exported and uh, people started like coming up with these patterns and things. I might be wrong about that. It might go back a little bit further than that, but it seems like it was around the 1930s that it started to become like a pretty recognizable thing in Iceland and then people who would go to Iceland would be like oh this is the folk dress or the Icelandic dress or whatever and it's like well it is now it wasn't before but it is now however by now in uh, 2018 it has definitely become well known for their lopi sweaters and their lopi yarn hand knitters all over the world make what i would call pilgrimages to iceland to see the sheep and view the beautiful country and buy some lopi yarn and bring it home to knit their own masterpieces of mittens and sweaters and hats and uh, that is on my bucket list for sure i would love to go to iceland for multiple reasons not the least of which is to see the sheep and feel some lopi yarn so Leave me a comment below and let me know, have you ever worked with lopi yarn or any kind of Icelandic sheep? Have you ever been to Iceland or ever seen an Icelandic sheep? Um, and uh, would you ever want to go? Whether you've been or not, would you ever want to go again? Tell me what you liked about this episode. Tell me what other sheep breeds you're interested in. We are, um, actually, we've made a lot of progress through some of the more common sheep breeds. I do have a couple more I want to get to, but I'm thinking in the new year with our wool series, we're gonna expand out into like alpaca and yak and some of those as well, because I know those are really popular fibers with hand knitters today. And I've had an awful lot of people begging me for some uh, information on alpaca because it's a wonderful, wonderful yarn to work with. But like all wools, it is great when you know the characteristics and history a little bit better so that you can make more informed decisions about what to use it for. So I hope that this will help to inspire your imagination, get you to try something new. One of the main points of this wool series was to introduce you to different sheep breeds that you may or may not have heard from before and take some of the fear factor out of working with them. If you have a little bit more information on what they're good for and how to work with them and an appreciation for where they've come from and what makes them special, it can be really a lot less intimidating to pick up a skein or two and give it a try and just cast on something unique which is also why from time to time I like to show you what I'm working with, like when I did the goth farm review and I knit some really cute little like cuff wrist warmers with drapey um, little cuffs out of some really rugged breeds that I'm not used to working with generally. And I had so much fun trying a totally new yarn that was completely unlike anything I'd ever worked with before. And it was really fun to get to test it out for you, show it off and inspire you guys to go try something completely new and out of your comfort zone. So let me know what you've been trying in the comments below. Give this video a like, feel free to share, and I will see you next week, but it is now time to cast off. Love you.